International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. I was a very early Michael Schultz fan without realizing it. So I loved Crush Groove, I loved Carbon Copy, I obsessed over Scavenger Hunt, Car Wash, um, Bustin' Loose, and of course The Last Dragon. Um, Michael Schultz has been working for, uh, for a really long time and is just uh, still working. He's, um, he's uh, directing uh, for TV now and um, he's, some of the shows he's working on that you may have seen is Blackish, New Girl, Black Lightning. So Michael Schultz is still very, very, very active, um, fortunately for all of us. How many of you saw Purple Rain? Okay. Uh, Purple Rain actually kind of laid the groundwork for the existence of this film, laid it in a way that it proved to Warner Brothers that there was a, a huge audience for black music. Uh, you know, why they needed to be proved is, is uh, beyond me because it was evident many, many years before, but it was very successful and they had a distribution pattern that was basically in so-called white theaters um, because in 1985 when this film, maybe it was released in 86, I don't remember, um, there was still the notion that black audiences went to certain theaters, white audiences went to certain theaters and never the twain should meet. Uh, <laughs> but th that was still like the overriding thing. So when I presented Warner Brothers with the idea of doing this film, I, I said, you have never heard this music. You don't know who any of these artists are, but in two years, your kids are going to be singing this. Uh, and because I knew the head of Warner Brother Records and had that conversation with him, he uh, then called up the film company and said, make this movie, you know? Uh, but when they released it, we were trying to tell them how to distribute the film. <laughs> when they released it, they released it in the same pattern that they did Purple Rain. So, all the black kids and the, and the Latino kids and the Asian kids who were interested in this movie would go to the white theaters and believe it or not, this movie caused riots in the theaters uh, in New York. Why? Because <clears throat> it, it would be playing in a shopping center in upstate New York somewhere. And the owner of the mall saw all these black kids walking through his mall to go to the theater. He goes to the, th he's freaking out. He goes to the theater and makes them close the, the, the theater. So all the kids who are standing in line are saying, what are you talking about? We want to see this movie. And they, and, and they started, um, a riot, but it was the fear of the of the mall owner seeing all these black kids in his mall that created the situation, not the movie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, first and foremost, Michael, I want to just say thank you so much for such a wonderful film. And to the audience, you guys realize this is a real treat um, to have the director. Can we just give him a little bit of? of <laughs> All right, so we met earlier today, um, and we've been in correspondence a little bit before, and I wanted to ask you some of your first thoughts about, um, you know, the film has a kind of a sense of, you're going from music video to music video at a time before music video really reached mainstream acceptance. So it's a musical, it has a, a sense of character development around the, the, the songs, but you have a long history of dealing with theater, 
and dealing with kind of being an alternate vision, you know, of how the theater and cinema would con connect. Do you, tell us a little bit about your 60s, uh, when you were first starting in the 60s. Remember we were talking about earlier today, uh, 64, 65, 66, right. Right. Uh, some of your first gigs. Well, um, I, I kind of came from a theater background. And um, when I decided that this is what I wanted to do, and wanted to be a director, I had no role models. Gordon Parks had not appeared on the scene. Melvin hadn't appeared on the scene. Melvin Van Peebles, yeah. Right, Melvin Van Peebles. Um, and I was a, a college student. Um, I had no intention of being in this business when I first went to college. I was going to be Colin Powell of the Air Force. I wanted to be a general in the Air Force and fly jets, you know. Uh, and uh, calculus and I did not see eye to eye. <laughs> and uh, I finally realized in my sophomore year that I was not supposed to be, you know, uh, doing that. I had no idea what I wanted to do, and so I spent my sophomore year in college at Madison, Wisconsin, sitting in the back of uh, this little movie theater, watching films by Fellini, Zeffirelli, Antonioni, Kurosawa, uh, Lelouch, and it was kind of like my own private film school. And I sat in the back of the theater saying, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I could tell those kind of stories because we as a people have so many stories to tell uh, that are not being told. Uh, and the world is not being enriched because of that. So <laughs> I decided go to the theater school. I couldn't afford to go to film school. Uh, but I could afford to go to the theater school in the city that I lived in, Milwaukee. And I got into it uh, and realized in order to be in that theater department uh, at Marquette University, you had to do everything. They had no directing program, but they had a wonderful theater program that was kind of like uh, an off-Broadway theater uh, in a collegiate environment, and you had, in order to be in the company, you had to act, you had to uh, go to acting class, you had to go to ballet class, you had to uh, design sets or make costumes or whatever. So you had a, a full, well-rounded education as a theater person. And I was not interested in acting and all of that stuff, but um, I, I wanted to learn about how to work with actors. Uh, <laughs> so I go through this theater program and my collegiate mind is saying, well, if you really um, learn this material, and we're working with Shakespeare and Moliere and uh, Beckett and all kinds of um, fantastic um, uh, creative artists in the theater, and I'm learning how this the director of the theater is working with the student actors and just watching the whole thing and saying, okay, uh, if I learn this, go to New York and make a name as a director, then somebody's going to offer me a movie, right? <laughs> so I, I get to, this is a long story, which I'm going to make real short. I get to New York, get involved in a, off-Broadway theater called The American Place. Um, the first play they're doing is based on the Amistad incident. Um, and I wind up acting in a play starring Frank Langella, Roscoe Lee Brown, some Mark Ryland, some wonderful New York actors. And I'm, I'm like understudying Frank Langella and on stage, I was a terrible actor by the way, uh, <laughs> because I'm on stage thinking, well, he shouldn't be saying the line that way, you know, or he shouldn't be over here. I'm, I'm in my director head, you know, uh, uh, instead of being invested as an actor. So I couldn't wait to get on the other side of the footlights. Um, but the play won five Obie Awards for everything. 
I finally convinced somebody to let me direct an off-Broadway play that w starred Roscoe Lee Brown and Colleen Dewhurst, who was married to George C. Scott. She was a fabulous actress. And I get my first job at the McCarter Theater, get great reviews uh, on a, uh, a play called Waiting for Godot. Wow, Samuel Beckett. You did Samuel Beckett. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then do a play called The Emperor Jones, a Eugene O'Neill play, uh, get great reviews, go to New York. The Negro Ensemble Company uh, was just beginning to form. Uh, and I don't know if any of you know anything about theater, but the NEC was a company funded by the Ford Foundation. And it became the place that developed playwrights um, and actors. Um, Rosalind Cash, uh, Esther Roll, Moses Gunn, um, Lonnie Elder, the playwright. They did s created Soldier's Story and uh, on and on. Uh, and really kind of blossomed black theater in New York. <clears throat> I then directed their first play, win an Obie Award for Best Directing of that year. Um, what year was it? Uh, just that uh, was like 69. Okay, so context. I, want to, I just want to give the audience, because these are a lot of dots to connect. Yeah. So it's very rare that people move from theater into such a, pow a powerful place in cinema. And right. um, so by the, if we skip forward a little bit to the 80s, hip-hop was new. Um, there had been a series of films, a little bit, you know, Wild Style, uh, stuff like Rap Attack and other things that came a little bit later. But you, uh, you were able to bring a, a professional, rigorous uh, quality from the theater into these newer uh, films you were working on. Exactly. So that's where I think, and also don't forget, as an African-American, these are really difficult times to get gigs in Hollywood. And people like Ava DuVernay are still talking about that to this day. Um, how did you feel about opening new doors? I mean, because these are, you come from a very strong, rigorous situation in theater. And next thing you know, in film, you know, it's probably a little bit of a different world and a different approach. Right. Well, well um, in my theater work, I, I just considered work, doing the best work possible. <clears throat> I get my first Broadway play. I call it Does a Tiger Wear a Necktie. I hire a young actor named Al Pacino. Uh, <laughs> my, my wife uh, plays the leading uh, female role. All three of us get nominated for Tonys, you know, and uh, a producer comes up to me after one of the performances and offers me a movie, you know, so, which was based on Lorraine Hansberry's To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. I make this little 16 millimeter film. It becomes like a PBS classic. Um, and I had something I could bring to Hollywood and show the system that I could do the job, right? So I have wonderful actors like Ruby D and uh, Roy Scheider before he became Roy Scheider and uh, um, had a fabulous cast. And um, I got into television. So Universal at the time uh, would hire directors and put them under a seven-year contract. Um, they had um, Steven Spielberg under contract for seven years, and we're, we're doing things like um, Rockford Files, <laughs> <laughs> Beretta, Toma, um, all of that kind of stuff. So that was kind of like my way to break in uh, through television at a time when television was considered, you know, uh, beneath film. Uh, and um, I finally got a chance to do uh, Cooley High. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I was under contract to Universal, and, but I had written in my contract because I had this Broadway experience and I had done um, a couple of smaller films that had never seen the light of day. And I said, well, I can get out of this contract if um, somebody offers me a Broadway play and you don't match it, 
Or if somebody offers me a film and you don't match it, then I can get out of the contract. So I go to them and say, okay, I got this film. You, you have a matching order, uh, offer. And they say, kid, if you walk out of this contract, you'll never work in this town again. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. I go do Cooley High. And I knew Cooley High was, was going to uh, be great in its own way because it was breaking boundaries. Um, the black exploitation period had kind of ushered in uh, into Hollywood's consciousness that, hey, there's an audience out there that's not being served um, and we can make money on it. Uh, but doing films about real people, real kids with real problems and connections was not in their thinking. So Cooley High kind of broke, in, broke the mold um, along with Gordon's Learning Tree and, and uh, others. And uh, because I had been involved in the television world in uni at Universal, I kind of knew how to navigate uh, in the um, executive offices. And before Cooley High came out, I worked my way into the, um, into the president of Universal's office and got a meeting and told him, oh, well, what happened was Spielberg was supposed to direct the film called Bingo Long and the Traveling All-Stars. Anybody see that film? Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a film about black baseball and um, Spielberg then opted out of it and I wanted to do that film. I wanted to direct that film. So I go to the president of Universal and say, I should do this film. I'm the best black director in Hollywood. Matter of fact, I'm the only black director in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because I was bold enough to do that, uh, that kind of stuck in his head. He said, well, it's a Barry Gordy film and he's over in Italy doing mahogany, and if you can get to him, fine, you know, it's okay with me. But by the time I got to Barry, he had already hired somebody else. When Cooley High came out, the president of Universal saw the film and called me and asked me, said, we got a little film called Car Wash uh, <laughs> that you might be good for, and that's how it happened. So let's, let's unpack some of this, because I really think it's important that the audience realize, um, as an independent African-American director, there was a lot of bar barriers. Um, and that's something that I think this film series has really helped highlight. Uh, there's a very rich vernacular of directors, uh, such as Michael, who have you know, bypassed the boundaries and then opened doors for many other artists. So let's say Car Wash, you, know, you had Richard Pryor, who's, if you haven't seen Car Wash, go immediately. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, I love the soundtrack. When I was a kid, that was something that really influenced a lot of hip-hop people. Then on the other end of the spectrum, everybody saw Cooley High. You know, uh, many uh, hip-hop artists had always talked about that. It's in a lot of early raps. Um, so how do we evolve from Car Wash, which was set in the 70s disco era? Uh, don't forget, of course, politically speaking, Nixon had been uh, you know, ousted. Uh, you then had the end of the Vietnam War. You had economic problems. Uh, and then, so that, that 70s era was about a certain kind of economic uh, unease in the world. And then, so this was like a moment of levity, a very life-affirming film. Um, and it's just, then you segue into other projects. But let's, uh, could you talk about some of the political context a little bit? Because I mean, Car Wash, on one hand, is usually viewed as a comedy and a musical. But there is a subtle uh, critique of how people think about the everyday politics of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love for, because you, you're a philosopher of these things. I mean, I think it's really, uh, you should hear him tell stories of all these different uh, eras. Do you well, riff on that for a second? Well, you know, I, I, let me start by just kind of painting a picture of, of what it was like trying to get into the studio system. Um, because of all of the f uh, uh, m marching in the streets, the activism um, in the streets about 
opening up uh, some of the unions, Hollywood started to take note. And I just happened to be in that right place at the right time with the right set of skills to get into what was basically a closed system. They were looking for any black talent so they could say, we got one, you know, <laughs> we're okay. <laughs> don't, don't march against us. Uh, so the unions in LA started to open up and started to admit uh, folks of color and women um, who had been totally unrepresented in, in the uh, behind the scenes uh, of the studios. So uh, I go to New York. Hollywood is opening up a little bit. New York is absolutely the old white boy system. If you're not in the family, you don't get in the business. I, I do a film called um, The Last Dragon. It's a big budget film, <laughs> about $21 million at the time, which was a big budget at the time. 100 some people in the crew, there was one black teamster. And in the middle of production, he gets fired, right? The pr production was so big, I didn't have time to fight the, the the system, but I vowed to come back to New York and do a film with an all-black crew because the refrain was, we don't have any black crew because they, they don't exist. They don't have the skills. And, but meanwhile, there's all kinds of people um, who have the ability but are just not getting in the door. So when I was approached, um, to do a documentary about the whole phenomenon of rap. Um, I took that, I said, oh, okay, if we can get this film made, I'll go back to New York, find every uh, black crew person that I can find and prove that there, there is a, a wide array of talent that, that the talent does exist, they're just not being allowed to get in. So, so I go to New York. Um, you saw Ernest Dickerson's name as the DP. The, uh, do any of you know who Ernest Dickerson was, is? Yeah, uh, yell it out. Yep. He was, uh, Ernie, Ernie became, uh, his first film was Brother from Another Planet. Crush, yeah. Crush Groove was his second film. And er, Ernest Dickerson and basically all of my crew became Spike Lee's go-to people. Um, so uh, Ernest Dickerson was the DP on all of, uh, Spike's movies, uh, Do the Right Thing, Malcolm X, on and on. Um, and, and he's now directing, you know. So let's talk about uh, that transition because when you um, set up a situation where you have more and more black people getting involved with the film, um, say for example, to me at least, when I saw Crush Groove, um, it was so heartwarming to see these period areas of New York City. And um, you really highlighted that, like the disco fever spot, um, I want you to tell some of the stories about that. Also, um, you know, just the way the vernacular of the time, the clothing, um, the Adidas track suits, things like that, um, those would probably be reflected, I think, or more robustly in, because you had a crew that was very involved with the culture. Right. Um, so can you unpack that a little bit? Because it's, it's really important, I think, that the film wasn't a documentary. It became much more dimensional. Right. Well, George Jackson uh, was a young black executive, junior executive at Universal, who had just come in, um, and very, very brilliant. Um, he and um, Doug McHenry um, went to, were Harvard grads. Doug was a Harvard and um, where do you uh, Stanford Stanford grad? Yeah, a double major. 
in business, and they came to me with the idea of uh, with a Wall Street Journal article about rap <laughs> and um, how it was an underground movement that was just making all kinds of money, and they they said. You want, are you interested in doing a documentary? I said, oh, sounds interesting. They take me to a concert in Long Beach, California, on the same night that the Jackson Five were doing their last concert in Dodger Stadium. And I'm thinking, nobody's going to be at this concert. Everybody's at the, ja at the Jackson Five concert. We walk into the um, arena auditorium, and there are 17,000 kids jumping up and down and, you know, throwing their fists in the air like you just don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we look at each other and say, shit, this is no underground movement. <laughs> there was no advertising except on radio, right? Uh, and we just knew that this, this was a phenomenon. So we enjoy the concert. We go backstage after it to talk to the the groups of course they had all seen Cooley high uh and were fans of that so they knew who i was once we got introduced and i asked them i said uh, you know we want to make a documentary about you guys and they said oh shit, no no uh, we want to ride the horse shoot the gun kiss the girl you know <laughs> we want to act and, and I'm saying, well, nobody knows who you are, you know? Nobody in Hollywood knows who you are. There's no way we can raise the money to, to uh, do a movie about a uh, bunch of people that nobody knows. And they said, well, we're not interested. Goodbye. <laughs> so the three of us go back to my house, and we sit down and say, okay, we have to come up with an idea that will appeal to their vanity, you know, uh, and get them on board because in four months, five months, they're going to be on summer tour and we'll never be able to get this movie done. Uh, so we come up that night with, a, with an idea to tell the story of Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin's business of making records in their dorm room uh, and the fat boys trying to, you know, win a contest and go back to the group and present the idea and they get on board. Uh, and then I go to the studio, um, which I had mentioned before the film, and go to Mo Austin, the head of Warner Brothers Records, and say, okay, uh, your kids are going to be singing this music, right? And the reason that I knew that is because my uh, youngest sons, my two youngest sons were 10, uh, 12, and 14 at the time. And when the idea of doing a documentary I, I kind of bounced it off of them, and I said, have you, have you guys ever heard of Run DMC? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> the Fat Boys? Ah! <laughs> right. Curtis Blow? And I had never heard a lyric. And they knew all the lyrics of all the songs of all of these groups, right? And I'm, you know, I'm this Hollywood director making movies, and I'm saying, I am so out of it. I have got to make this movie just to be connected to my kids, right? <laughs> so. so, but the, the, the beautiful thing about the film is that it's, it's a musical in a certain sense, but so many of the songs actually became hits. Um, so Sheila Lee had been produced by Prince. I don't know if you guys know him. She even had the same moves as Prince, which is kind of wild, and the clothes and stuff like that. I, I was always chuckling about the, the soft tint, uh, the glow on the, the cinematography, which reminded me of like Duran Duran videos or something in the 80s. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about the musicality. Well, well, well talking about that, yeah, yeah. what was so interesting to me at the time was, you know, I, we kind of concocted this idea to do, basically have an excuse to do a concert and tie us a storyline uh, 
through all the musical numbers. And the studio said, no, we have to have a known act. So unless you bring us a known act, we're not going to do this movie, right? Um, so we came up with Sheila E. And um, because Warner Brothers had had the success with Prince and Purple Rain, Sheila E. was on their radar, and she fit the bill of being a known act, known quantity, that they could somehow market in the film. And so once we got her, it was kind of like a go proposition, almost. Um, and so, and that created a little, a little unease in the whole rap community because they were saying, oh, you know, it's like we don't want to work with, with that element. That's not rap, you know. And so we kind of worked this little, kind of teaching her how to rap uh, <laughs> into the film, you know, in order to appease the the people. So we had to get Russell Simmons on board. Russell and Rick, Charles Stetler, the guy who played Beaker, uh, was the manager of the Fat Boys. We had to get him on board. And so managing all these uh, egos uh, was, was quite interesting. Um, and we're doing the film for less than a million dollars. You, know? you know what was amazing though, is that how young everybody looked. Like LL, I don't know if everyone saw the scene where LL Cool J comes in, my radio, you know, and so on. I mean... And Rick Rubin had been producing a lot of the tracks from his dorm room. Right. Um, there's, if anyone knows New York, there's certain classic moments, like uh, the Sabaros at 49th Street and Broadway, if anybody knows Times Square. It looks totally different now. Um, so you, it was really a heartwarming kind of thing to go through the, the cinematography and the, the spaces of New York. Um, but yeah, let's unpack that a little more, because I think um, so many people um, remember, and like Curtis Blow obviously was one of the legendary figures at that time. Major. And Prince was the bit, one of the biggest pop stars in the world. So when they, I don't know if everybody noticed, there was this one scene where they have a poster of Prince in the back. Um, and the, the dance moves, for me at least, is still, it's still hot. Like every time I see it, I'm just like, wow. Um, people, kid, like the K-pop kids in Korea are still trying to dance like that, you know? <laughs> right. um, so, let's, did the film, did you, did you present it in other countries? That's one thing I want to talk about, the international impact, too, because remember you said sometimes films will do differently here in the U.S. than they will in other parts of the world. Right. Um, so, you know, I want to connect that to a little bit of the, the way hip-hop uh, blew up at the time to some of the more international issues that were popping. Well, unfortunately, because when the... Uh, the when the film came out and it created some riots that really had nothing to do with the, <laughs> with the anything except the kids who wanted to see it had to go to places that other people were scared to see that many black kids in one place, you know. Uh, the were still, they were informally segregated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Warner Brothers kind of, kind of, they didn't put the kibosh on the film, but they didn't really press it. They didn't really move it into the international arena the way that uh, Car Wash um, was able to succeed because the studio got behind Car Wash. They did not really get behind Crush Groove once they got scared of, oh, it may create riots and X, Y, Z, you know? Uh, and the whole rap phenomenon was still too early in its infancy as far as the rest of the world was concerned. But the film opened the floodgates for the United States in terms of exposing music to, um, to the world. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of your current stuff because now it's been decades since you've done that. And uh, you do Blackish, which is a, a wide, wildly popular, right? Have you seen Blackish? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what would you say, uh, you know, Michael Schultz today, 2018, looking at Michael Schultz in 1985, what's the, what's the big difference? Uh, the big difference is that I got lazy and started doing all kinds of television <laughs> instead of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> instead of. Uh, 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 continuing to buck the system to try to get quality uh, work done. Um, so it's been, it is a constant battle 
to bring subject matter, storytelling of real quality uh, and get it through the Hollywood system. So no matter how big a, a, a film may be, you know, you'll get Will Smith, giant hit, and the studios will say, well, that's, you know, that's not a black whatever, right? Um, they'll make an excuse for the success of it and not acknowledging that people are really interested in African American stories, you know? So, so to get anything done like um, a story about the Haitian Revolution, which is a phenomenal story uh, that deals with um, the essence of racist mentality in this country um, and the power struggle that ex exists between different colors of black people <laughs> uh, and the way it changed our country uh, is just a fascinating story. The story of Alexander Pushkin, who is the greatest Russian poet um, uh, in existence, who the Russians tear up and cry over and put flowers on his statue. Th that story has never been told because it's not considered interesting. The story of the uh, Alexander Dumas and his father um, who created the Three Musketeers and the Man in the Iron Mask uh, who were uh, black Caribbean um, people uh, telling their stories um, uh, just doesn't get through the Hollywood system and their stories that um, that are as exciting uh, and as valuable and eye-opening as any of the big blockbusters that you've seen. So now with Black Panther kind of blowing everybody in Hollywood's mind, um, uh, it'll open the door for a little while, uh, but unless that door is really filled with uh, other films and other genres that continue to prove that there's an audience, there's a desire, there's a hunger, there's new material. You don't have to keep doing the same old um, uh, tent pole version one, two, three, four mm -hmm. in order to bring a, a, a vast global audience. But if you open it up to the way the world really is and people that with people who are in the real world, then you got a big audience. So, Well, I mean, through your work, and th thank you for that. I mean, just it's really powerful to see how many doors you open for other directors. Spike Lee, or one could argue Boots Riley's new, if you haven't seen Boots Riley's new film, Sorry to Bother, it's brilliant. Um, yeah, it's a great film. Um, and I, I actually produced some projects with uh, Saul Williams called Slam. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we were talking about you uh, during some of that. So it's, I think that there's a legacy that you've, you've left and a very solid foundation for, for pushing the envelope. And that's what evenings like tonight are about. Um, you know, I have to admit, it always goes back to my mom and my dad. My, uh, both parents were professors. Uh, my mom was a historian of design. Uh, my dad was dean of Howard University's law school. So I grew up in a household that very much valued the, the fact that the arts needed to be in conversation with social justice. There was no way in hell you would be able to leave our house any day without thinking about social justice, women's rights, my, you know, boom, boom, my mom would always, you know. You know so um, that's something that was just drilled into me at a very young age. Uh, and growing up in Washington, D.C., uh, it was a very multicultural downtown scene. Uh, we had, uh, on one hand, we had Ronald Reagan, and then you had Mayor Marion Barry who got put in jail for smoking crack. You know, so, um, you know, it was D.C. in the 80s when I was growing up. Uh, that was... You know, you had Iran, Contra, Scandal, crazy stuff like that. So for me, at least, I, um, I was never planning on DJing. DJing was a kind of a hobby that I did when I was in college. Um, and my parties became popular because I mixed a lot of styles together instead of just going for one formula. So on Friday night uh, at Bowdoin, where I went to school, you could throw a party, charge five bucks at the door, 
and you'd walk out of there with like, I don't know, 2,000 bucks as a sophomore in college on a Friday night. That's, you know, it's good money. So DJing began to subsidize my art and other stuff. So when you say I'm an interloper or this or that, for me, these categories are very 20th century. They're in the rearview mirror. And it's now time to celebrate the history of these things so that we, the more you know the history of film and progressive movements, whether it be multicultural, feminism, uh, whatever uh, progressive narrative, these are very dark, cynical times. I mean, you can just turn on anything and you have Trump uh, and this madness looming out of every media. Um, so uh, long story short, I view uh, people like us um, as giving t people tools to pull apart some of the, the, the fabric of these bizarre legacies of the 20th century's racism, sexism, whatever you want to call these, these negative shit that we've <laughs> inherited. You know, so like, I'd, I'd like to think of Michael's work as helping people decolonize mentally, you know, just so um, for my own artwork as a DJ, um, it's just, you know, I produce film soundtracks, I produce other artists, I've worked with people like Yoko Ono or actually we, I wanted, I still wanted to ask you about the Beatles because I did a remix of the Beatles last year. We, um, he, he, um, he produced the film Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, you know, so. Lots of, the idea is to just break these categories down, you know, and just move between them comfortably as a human being rather than just one zone. Um, that, at least that's my philosophy, and you know, Michael's been an inspiration. And, and, and mine is very primitive. Uh, the whole, I, I, I was kind of raised through my theater training and the ethics uh, and the aesthetics of the art is really just storytelling. And storytelling around the campfire in the tribal jungles of whatever, uh, all of the primitive tribes, the elders and the youth told stories that really related to survival, told stories about how to live, told stories about how you move in the world and how you become uh, a contributive, valuable human being. And everybody learned from those stories. It, it was entertainment, but it was education. It was a way of helping each other um, survive and band as a family as a, as a global tribe. And so I just took that concept and I always view the work that we do as just an expansion of that, trying to tell the stories that will bring us together, that will teach us how to live with each other, teach us how to be better human beings, teach us how to make the world a better place, to have a life-affirming, um, uh, message that this is how the world is, this is how we can travel through it. I just wanted to say, I don't have a question, I just want to say thank you for contributing so much to our culture, for making meaningful work. Um, I was so excited. I, we drove, I drove all the way from Sacramento because I saw that Crush Groove was going to be playing tonight. I was like, oh, I got I to gotta be there because <laughs> I remember sitting in the Four Star Theater in Eastmont Mall watching Crush Groove for the very first time, and albeit people were shooting harpoons through, through straws, hitting us in the back of the neck, but people were dancing in the aisles during that time. So I, this Crush Groove is a celebration of music and a celebration of culture, and I'm so grateful that you have the wherewithal, the focus, and and the commitment to making meaningful work. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. So everybody, uh, can we just give him a big shout out? Thank you again, Michael. All right. All right. That was really good. Thank you. Thank you. Love that. I love that. <laughs>